So we have some panelists, uh, as it is with senior, senior management, sometimes uh, schedules change. So we have to do the panel now, and then we'll return to uh, Mary's exercise and get a chance uh, to, um, to do some practicing there with the elevator speech. So can I call the panelists to come up to the panel? Okay, so as Scott's making his way down, we'll just go ahead and get started. The purpose of the panel is to give you an opportunity to hear from some senior leaders, both in the, in the U.S. government as well as uh, in industry. And also, we want this to be really interactive, so if there are particular questions along the lines of what we're discussing, you know, feel free to, to interject, raise your hand, and, and I'll call on you. Um, but these are questions that we thought would be helpful for uh, interns, people starting off your career, um, uh, as you all are. So with that, we're gonna go, to a, um, we're gonna go through several of these questions. For, for you guys have copies of the same thing I do. So I thought we'd start with question number two. I think that's a, a really interesting one. Question number, the second one down here, it says, please briefly discuss your individual career paths and how it differed from what you may have thought you'd be doing in your career when you were starting out. Of course, very frequently we snake through our careers to, through different things and maybe we end up doing something we didn't think initially we would be doing. So why don't you start off just, uh, I guess we'll start with Scott and go, well. Why don't we, yeah, we start down that Okay, way. start with Ree and just introduce yourself and then. Uh, Easy way out. <laughs> you know, when you go first, you know, there's no wrong answer because you start out, right? So, good afternoon. My name is Ree Kennebrew. I currently work for Schlumberger as the Domain Planning Manager for North America. So, my career path, uh, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin as a chemical engineer. I've currently been working for the company for 15 years and um, took a lot of different routes. I am an engineer by heart, but my jobs have included uh, training and development and staffing. I've done uh, recruiting, diversity manager. I'm currently the planning manager for North America, manage equipment, people, and inventory, and, and uh, products. Uh, a new job offer as of last Thursday, so I'll be moving and managing the Stimulation East Division, which means take the U.S. and divide it in half, everything <coughs> to the right, I will receive for fracturing and stimulation of the business with Schlumberger, which is the oil and gas company. That's currently my new role. So did I think I would start out like this? No. I was born in oil and gas, but I always thought I'd be working with the refinery. And so to come out and work for a service company, to look at the very beginning of what happens before a refining process was quite different. And even as an engineer, it wasn't my first career path. I was going to be an obstetrician gynecologist. Yeah, biology too did not work for me. <laughs> no, fetal cat was a no-go. So <laughs> I'm good at math and science. That's how I became an engineer. And so um, this has been a great career. I've traveled the world and seen the world. And um, so no, it's not what I thought I would be doing. I thought I would be working in a refinery and that was going to be my job for the, for the rest of my life. And, and you also got an inside view on government, did you not? Yes, so I used to be a Mickey Leland Fellow when I was uh, <laughs> in college as well. <laughs> Okay, well, I thought I was going to be a singer. <laughs> I was in the studios all night, all day, to three o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning, just waiting on the hit, and it never happened. <laughs> so um, after that, I started working for the government. Um, I knew I would be in management. I always wanted to be in management, but I'm a management analyst by trade. So, um, my career, I just, I moved around a lot and, and I encourage that. Um, regardless of what you're doing, just move around. Don't just stay put in one area. You gotta get five years experience and move to the next level and just continue to move. I think a lot of times we don't move. We just stay put. So um, I've worked for over, maybe about five different federal agencies. I worked for um, the National Institute of Health then I went to the Drug Enforcement Administration. And when I was there, I thought I was going to be a special agent. So I went from singing to special agent, <laughs> back to management. <laughs> so um, from Drug Enforcement Administration, I went to the um, Census Bureau. And mm. then the architect of the Capitol. I was at the architect of the Capitol for six years, and then the Department of Energy. So I was in the HR kind of um, arena, but not really an HR person, but doing strategic big picture resource management. I did that basically in all the agencies I was in, resource planning. And then when I went to 
the Department of Energy. It started off in HR, but it didn't last long. After about a year, I went to Fossil Energy, and the rest is history. <laughs> I know Serena, but and her son is actually in the song business, I think. Yeah, he works right? for so, Sony. So chip off the block. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked him to get me a contract. I'm still <laughs> sorry. Okay, you're still at it? <laughs> yeah, he told me I was too old now. <laughs> See, I'm going to give the message that Serena, I think, just gave there is that we're still looking for what we want to be when we grow up, and you've probably heard that from a lot of people. And I think it is hard. I, I have 30 years of experience, seven outside the government, um, whatever the math, 23-ish in the government. And um, I don't know that I've ever looked more than a year or two ahead. It's just personal preferences, and I think you're all going to find yourselves differently uh, mm -hmm. as you pursue your career path. And so what I always did when I pursued my career path is I would get a job and I would just kind of see the scenario around me, see what opportunities might exist, and then just use what I felt that um, what I liked best and what I wanted to focus on. And, um, and sometimes those opportunities come your way, sometimes they don't. But one of my recommendations to everyone is to always kind of be looking at the jobs in and around you and about you uh, in whatever career path you follow and just use that kind of as your guide and your basis and sometimes you'll get to go that pathway, other times you won't. Don't get frustrated if one pathway gets cut off. There are always other pathways and, and be flexible. And, and if there's one message I can leave you with uh, on that basis is be flexible. Another thing too that I'll get to um, in some of the other questions, because it's something I really think is important is, w w the first question was give an elevator speech and I know I didn't see it until we got here, Serena didn't <laughs> either, and we're like, uh oh, that's an elevator speech made. <laughs> And, and, and the reality is, I think our elevator speeches would be very different than yours. Mm -hmm. um, so the message that I'm going to keep pounding on as you hear my comments today is to try to distinguish yourself from the other person um, in interviews and a job, et cetera. Sometimes that's done by good design, and I have a bunch of examples I'll get to later on. Sometimes it's by dumb luck, <laughs> but by giving you some of those insights and perspectives in interviews that I've done, interviews that I've had with people, I think it can kind of give you some insight to what sets you apart. Because we're in a day and age right now where a lot of people have good grade point averages. A lot of people have summer experiences. This experience is excellent for you and is going to go a long way in your resumes. But at the end of the day, as a hire, sometimes you see, see you know, 50 applications and 50 resumes and, and you almost can't tell them apart. Um, so what I'm going to do later in my remarks is give you some insights that I've gained for better or for worse over my years of why it's important to distinguish yourself from the other person. Hopefully you'll get some insights from the examples that I'll give you. So, mm. thank you. Great answer. Let's move down a couple questions here. It's a very good question. What is the best piece of advice that you received or wish you had received <laughs> uh, early in your career uh, that you would like to pass along to the next generation uh, of the workforce? <laughs> wow. Right when I'm thinking. <laughs> the best piece of advice that I received. Maybe I'll twist the question a little bit. The best advice that I can give you all is not to take anything personal at work. Hmm. It's not about you. Things will change all the time. And when you start looking internally, oh, it's about me. Why? why is this happening to me or why did this person say that to me or why am I impact? It's really, honestly, it's never really about you. So if you can just remember that, keep a positive attitude in life, in school, in your job, in everything, emotional intelligence, if you can take that seriously, you will go far. That is the best advice I could ever give you. Oh, sit back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so the best advice or, or what I can tell you is, um, so when you, you come out into the workforce, I think flexibility is the number one thing. Um, just because you had your eyes set on one thing and maybe you feel like I'm the best person for the job and I should have gotten a promotion, it's the reason why things happen. Maybe you're not ready for that step and you need to do something else before you can come back to that. So it's a reason for it. The next thing is, while you're young, I would encourage each of you, if you have an opportunity to see the world, travel it, enjoy it, you can always come home. Home is home, right? So mm. take it and enjoy it and enjoy the experiences because 
every place is different. Pittsburgh is not the same as in Texas, and Texas is not the same as what I see in California. And when you travel the rest of the world, every culture, every um, geology is different, you know, so it has a lot of things to offer. So that's my advice. I must be the seasoned veteran in a group because I keep getting to go last, so something's working there. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I think just maybe two things to think about, and this is both when you go into interviews, but also when you're just interfacing with employees on a day-to-day -day basis, is really just to be yourself. I, I think it's very easy for us to want to show ourselves in the very best light, and you know it's important to have confidence and, and to show that confidence. But at the end of the day, just be the person you are. And, People like to work with people they feel are just good people. And so never lose that side of it. Uh, one piece of advice I got in the, the, the slew of training we do over the years, and as you get into leadership, there's all sorts of leadership um, training that you go to. Uh, most of it very helpful. And the one piece of advice I got was continue to be humble. And, mm. and what I mean by that is, for example, if I don't know something or I have a dumb moment, you know, I'm not shy to say, you know, I don't understand. And even if it's a simple concept and, you know, I'm a senior leader, I, I think generally people like to see that. You know, you're just, again, being yourself, being truthful, being humble, mm. is that it's okay to say you don't understand a concept, even if it's a simple concept, you know, and then eventually you get it. So don't be afraid to be yourself and don't be afraid for those simple questions that a lot of people might get embarrassed or feel like, you know, a question they should know the answer to. I, I think just be yourself and, and, and be a humble person and, those kind of characteristics, uh, more often than not, tend to go a long way. You know, each of the uh, students uh, had the privilege of having a mentor for these 10 weeks. Um, can each of you discuss the, the, the different mentors you've had or the value of having a mentor and what, what that's meant to your career? <laughs> 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 hey, it wouldn't be long before they caught on. <laughs> the um, the, I think the, 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 it's great to have one-on-one -on -one mentors. Difficult to do, though, uh, in, in this day and age. For example, people are so busy, and I know I get asked all the time to mentor someone. And so if you're lucky to have those one-on-one -on -one mentorships, extremely important to take advantage of those. Those are hard to come by, in my view. Um, and it's great that you all were able to find mentors and take advantage of those while you can. Uh, I think in addition to that, also, always be kind of learning from the existing management. Okay, so use that mentorship. And, and no managers are perfect, we're all human beings, we all make mistakes, we all have, have personality quirks and things that come along with us. Um, but generally speaking, what I'd like to do throughout my career, and I'm still learning to this day, is I see how different managers approach things. And sometimes you're gonna like the approach they take, sometimes you're not, but in all cases, you're getting that mentoring feedback and input mm. that you can just use in your career. And again, I just continue to always pay attention to that and learn day by day as you interface with senior leaders on how they react to situations. And they're not always right in their reaction and, and you know, use your own personality on what works for you, but you will learn a lot by always paying attention to what senior leaders do and how they act around you. Very good point. For me, I, well, I've never had a mentor. I wish I did, but I just didn't. I never found the value in it when I was young, growing up in the government. And later on, during my career, I realized how important it is. But I will say this. If you select a mentor, select your mentor. Really interview them. And make sure there's someone that you look up to. You appreciate their career path, the way they carry themselves. That's important. So. Take that selection seriously. So that's my advice to you on that. So for me, for a mentor, I think of it as developing my board of directors. So these mm -hmm. are my, door, my board of directors. And so my mentors are not just in work or in oil and gas. They're outside of the business. You know, some are in and some are out. Some are older and some are my age. But it's more of I look for a person look at what they've done, you know, and it's just like you said, you, you interview them and it's someone you look up to, but it's also, someone, it's also someone who I respect, someone who's not gonna give me what they, what I, they think I wanna hear, they're gonna give me the, the answer that's the appropriate answer because 
they're investing in me and what's my future and trying to guide me in the right direction. So for me, it's my board of directors. Good. Any questions from the, from the field? George Mason, uh, Business Administration. University of Pittsburgh, uh, I have a BS and MS in Chemical Engineering and an MS in Petroleum Engineering. And, and just one point I'll make is, is I kind of try to get my messages in about distinguishing yourself. What you'll find in your career too, if, and my guess is most of you are just starting out, and if some of you are more seasoned, fantastic. But as you first start out, where you go to school and grade point average is very important. Once you're two years or more into the job, all that really matters and what distinguishes yourself is your job experience. So very unusual after the first couple years of your employment, even when you're looking for new jobs, that anybody really quite frankly cares where you went to school. But when you're starting out, it's very important. <coughs> Recruiters come there, et cetera, et cetera. So what you'll find is right now that's very important to you as, as you go to graduate and get jobs. But five years from now, my guess is the rest of your career, you might be asked a handful of times where you went to school, and it's just because people are curious as opposed to it makes a difference to your future jobs. Okay. That's a very good point. And for the, oh, I'm sorry. So I usually, when people, I don't get that question a lot. So, and for me, I went, I have, so I went to George Mason University. I have an MPA, a Master of Public Administration. I went to Central Michigan University. I have a Master of Science in Administration there, and I went to Strayer University. So I have, it's, so when I, people ask, I'm like, which one? <laughs> so I pick one, but yes. So it, that's to completely answer your question. There you go. Question? I'm gonna take the fifth. No. <laughs> if they were if they were deceased, if they were deceased, that would that would eliminate for me that would eliminate them right away. Uh, tough, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll safely answer that. <laughs> One thing we look at is when you when an applicant for me hops around a whole lot, like 12 months on one job. And then two months on another job, then 10 months, then nine months, then one year, you then eight. You just told people to move around a lot. <laughs> not that quickly. Two, not that quickly, okay. <laughs> so be She's strategic right in your moves. I thought I said five years. Five years? But okay. I did, right. So be strategic in your moves, because that's a red flag. And you may have a good reason for it. Oh, I got a promotion. But then if you continue to get promotions that quickly, it looks like you're not loyal. Oh, it's just about the money for you. So just be careful in how you strategically do that. Uh, you guys talked about flexibility. Now, when, when I'm, I'm, I don't know what anybody's classification is or is, so I'm guessing most of us don't have any idea. What would that look like now in this whole new system? Do you think that my first job will be with flexibility? So, for me, for undergrad, if you're a civil engineer and I'm not an architectural or, or a company who's doing structural, we're all in gas. What I'm asking for is your engineering skills, your math and science skills, and I'm going to transform you to do the job that I need you to do. That's what I mean by, for me, flexibility. When you were an architect, Lincoln, uh, what is something that you were concerned about that uh, maybe you should have been and something that you weren't thinking hmm. about that you probably should have had in mind? Good question. It's a long time ago for me. <laughs> no. Well, well, my advice, and, and it really depends on your situation, is, is, and I think Serena broached this, be pretty flexible, um, is the one uh, gentleman pointed out. Uh, when you're coming out of school with a degree, that degree could go into 100,000 different job types, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd be great if some of you said, no, I really want to focus on making plastics or something like that. The jobs, just in my view, aren't, just aren't that plentiful to be that specific. 
So you really do have to be flexible and don't limit yourself too much. I mean, I don't want to take anybody away from their dreams if you know, someday you want to be making semiconductor chips or something. But um, in today's job market, getting tougher and tougher, don't be inflexible. I mean, when companies come in, you know, just interview them all. And even if it's jobs you think you're not sure what they do, interview them and, and don't be afraid to give them a chance. Uh, if you have the benefit, um, uh, hiring goes in, in, in valleys and peaks. And so if you're lucky to be on that peak cycle where you have five or six offers in a given year, fantastic. You know, you, you get some selection. But the valleys are tougher where you're just happy to get one or two offers. Um, and what I'd recommend, since you really don't know what these disciplines are yet, I mean, you're still just learning all that, just be flexible. And, and, and if you get an offer somewhere and you're not exactly sure what it is, but uh, it's one of your few offers, don't be shy about taking it because the work experience is too, too critical than just stepping back. And, and I have uh, um, nieces, for example, a recent niece that just didn't like, she came out with engineering out of Penn State and just wasn't interested in the interview job she had. She was without a job for two years and quite frankly lucky to get back in the marketplace. Um, so I just caution you to be careful and, and take advantage of that recruitment opportunity at, at the schools. Because once you go away, you know, then you're kind of at the mercy of everything from headhunters to articles and, and journals. And it becomes much more difficult. So truly take advantage of, of those recruiting centers at school. And I'll add to that. To answer your question, for me, one thing I learned was I should have done was believe in myself. So there are jobs you may not take because you just simply don't believe in yourself. You don't think you can do it. It may seem like the job is much higher than you are. And I see a lot of students, um, youngsters, and old folks like myself. He's got old, too. He's old like me, <laughs> too. Um, but you have to believe in yourself. I can do it. If you're smart, you're bright, you could pick up on a lot. If you're a critical thinker, you're in school, the degrees that you all are getting, you're critical thinkers, you can do it. Now, I wouldn't set yourself, myself up for a position that I could not do, but believe in yourself. Um, if you're smart, you could pretty much um, pick up on whatever the job is, as long as it's in your field. That's a good question, and I, I know uh, as my older kids were going through college, what I would coach them is, relative to your smaller school, talk to the other kids, and especially kids that are getting jobs, and try to probe them a bit on, well, how did you get your job? You know, what did you apply to? Did you get it on campus? Um, I, I would also suggest that you also bug the professors a lot on, you know, you're looking for a job, and do they have any advice on who to send to, et cetera. Um, and I think you're really doing the right thing for getting into programs like this because now all of a sudden you're getting visibility to us and who knows this could be your future job. But learning from others, I think, in, in, the, in the job search skills is very important even at large schools and I've just beat on my kids, you know, ask John Doe how they got their job, ask Jane Doe how they got their job. And, and uh, you often learn a, a lot of different tricks of the trade, if you will, from those people that are having success. So what I found, um been the recruiting manager is that we would actually, students like yourself, when I'm in Atlanta and I'm at the Georgia Tech, we would come over to the career fairs and to the sessions and some of them will be at the interview and say, I'm not from this school, but here's my resume and I would like to know if you have time, maybe talk to you afterwards for an interview. So I even had that um, for some students to approach me that way, in which after we're doing interviewing, look at the resume, yes, I have time. Most of the time the recruiters will say, yes, I have time, or maybe I'll come back, I'll be back next week, because most of the time they're in the area, as they're, they're lead schools. And they'll actually set up a time to interview with you, so don't give up. And especially in programs like this, this is definitely an open door or, or a gateway um, to, to make that happen. He 
see a lot of people at work, and you'll find this. And so you'll have a job, and you want to go to the next level. I deserve a promotion. I want a promotion. Well, don't think you're going to get it where you are. If you do, you're lucky. That's great. But when you get to that point, and this is just my advice to you, when you get to that point where you want a promotion and you're ready for it and you feel that you deserve it, go after it. You don't have to beg your employer for it. Hopefully they'll see that you, you deserve the promotion. Um, but if, if you want, I mean, in the government it's a little different, but in industry, if you want a promotion, go for it. But don't expect to get it where you are. And that's where that flexibility we were talking about, that's where that comes in. That's what happened to me. I just moved around. You don't have to give it to me because I'm here and I'm at that level. I'll move around and get it. So that's my advice to you. So when I asked, is it earlier or later in career? Earlier, I think our voices are very, oh, I don't know what to say and mm -hmm. I don't think I deserve it. I think as we moved on and we get more established in the career, you know, we're more in tune with ourselves and what we can deliver and we let our work speak for ourselves. But um, what I've done, and, and if it's time, you will know when it's time, but I'm not gonna go to the table empty handed. I'm gonna come and say, this is what I've done, X, Y, and Z, and this is why I feel I deserve it. But you're right, don't expect that you're gonna get it because you may not. And even if it is, it may not be maybe that salary you were thinking or that next job, maybe something different. Just keep in mind, what is your end goal? What's your eye on the prize? This may be a stepping stone to that next level that you really are trying to get to. I add one piece to that. With a promotion, from my, this is just my opinion, make sure the promotion is not really necessarily, I want more money, but it's, I want more complexity. Because that's what a promotion is. You're saying, I want harder, more complex work. I'm ready for it. And I think if that's your attitude, that will take you far. I have a question. We often learn by failing. Do you have any discussions of any times where you've failed, maybe failed to take an opportunity? Any regrets in your career that, boy, I wish I'd stayed here longer. Boy, I wish I had left here earlier. <laughs> boy, I wish I had gone in a slightly different direction. Um, I tend to like to analyze the regrets and the errors of other people because I don't want to make them. Mm -hmm. So do you have any examples in that regard that would be helpful to the students? If I could have met Aretha Franklin, <laughs> I probably would have gotten that contract. But I'm going to let it go. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if this will hit home for you all, but it, it was when I had a summer engineering job between like junior and senior year. And um, you know, I, was, I was naive, my first real job in life, et cetera. And, um, and throughout the summer, I wasn't sure if I really liked the job or not. And I think, quite frankly, I maybe let that be known too much. And so I thought I was doing real well, and I thought they were going to hire me back. And then at the end of the year, I accidentally got a glimpse of the ratings at the end of the summer that I wasn't supposed to see. And I see online expecting to see good ratings because I thought I did well. And it basically said, I'm not sure that this candidate really wants to come back here. So all I'd suggest is always have a positive attitude unless you really, really don't want to come back to that job. Because I, had, I was faked out. Thought that I had done, did a great summer, and I, I think I did. But I had enough r casual remarks about, you know, not sure this industry is for me and that kind of thing. Be very cautious when you make those kind of remarks. And I'm glad I learned that early on in my career. No regrets? No, you only get the intern thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other, yes, other question? Yeah. What I've heard about the government is not hiring is free. <laughs> <laughs> the government is big, huge. Um, different agencies just depends on the agency. Um, the Department of Energy, we're hiring. It's just, hmm? we're hiring right? yeah, we're hiring. It's just a matter of which office, which organization, what kind of positions, do you have money? We all have different pots of money. Okay, so the government is hiring. If you go to usajobs.opm.gov, you'll see a lot of jobs. So we are hiring. I just have a follow-up question real quickly. Sure. So I've heard that on USAJobs, the job openings, if they were for like two weeks or less, I they already And if they're not more than a month, you cannot apply. This is what I've heard. Is this true? 
No, it's called a rumor. <laughs> and people say that all the time. Oh, don't even waste your time. Well, it's not true. I applied for a job once that was open for three days. And when I showed it to my friend, a friend of mine, this job is open for three days, should I apply? Oh, that job's taken. If it's open for three days, you might as well not waste your time. Well, I put it in, just pushed the button just to see, and I actually got hired at the architect of the Capitol. So it's, don't, don't believe that. Yeah, and to actually to talk to Serena's situation, sometimes you have a job offering, you leave it open for a week, you get 300 applications. You know, maybe you think, yeah, you know, maybe three days. Maybe I'll, I'll find the most highly motivated people. You know, there's other techniques. That you know, is a very good point. And so sometimes, back to your point, sometimes those jobs are announced for a week, three days, right. two weeks. It does not mean it's just announced because, and you're right, depending on the job, we feel that we can get enough candidates on this one by announcing it for four days or five days. So they're not pre-select, not all of them. Some may be, but even with that, you never know. You go to interview someone, and I'll just give it just a, a quick and then I'll shut up on this. But sometimes jobs that are, let's say, pre-select, meaning they have someone in mind, if you, you still, we have, a, we have an obligation as a manager to interview for the most part. So if you are, if I interview you and I have her in mind, but you blow her out the water, <laughs> you're gonna get hired and we'll have to figure out what we're gonna do with her. <laughs> so, <laughs> that happens. Yes. Are there been uh, in USA jobs, is there, are there any secrets that you can give us for getting into a federal position? Because I know I also feel like it's kind of a challenge right now. So I guess just give me any advice that you have on that. And then also, um, you were mentioning being flexible in interviews and I guess not go after a single uh, position. So how do you express to, uh, I guess, your employer that you are flexible and maybe you're not 100% certain what area or division that you want to go into um, without the Well, since Scott's worked longer than all, both of us, <laughs> I'll let him answer that. But the secret is just to apply. Yeah. That was your first question, okay? Yeah, and I, I would think a key, too, is if, if you're responding to an advertisement, that they probably have some focus already on that advertisement. And you probably do this already, but definitely go on the web and try to research and get a little better understanding. And I know sometimes that's hard in big companies, especially where it's hard to really assess what that job is. And so just some advice I have is come in and, and make them know that you did try to research and here's what you think the job's about. It looks like something that would be in your strike zone of interest. And then I'm sure that will open up discussions with that recruiter to fill you in more and, um, and always be interested. I mean, you know, even when you're not, because you can turn down an offer. Okay, mm -hmm. getting the offer is the hard part. So I'm not telling you to lie or fib or anything like that, but, but try to get the offers and then you can make some decisions. You don't have to take an offer that's given to you. One thing is network. You know, always you know, never know who you might meet, or and you always keep up with what's going on. For me, I keep up with technology in the company because um, I'm even though I've done other jobs and support roles, I'm still an engineer, you know, at heart. So I always want to make sure my feet are always grounded. I know what the latest technology and what's going on. Um, and if you know where you want to be, you always just keep focused on what are the different jobs and talking to people and how did you get to where you are to get to that next level. So that's what I've done. 
also think uh, a couple skill sets are important and, and probably the one skill set you, you've heard this time and time again, I suspect, communication, communication, communication. And communication in a sense of you're able to take really complicated topics and explain it quickly to a boss or you know, some important manager somewhere. And, and, and that's really, I think, is a skill. Like for example, I would point to some of our more recent presidents, um, Obama, Clinton, people like that, that regardless of your affiliation politically, just outstanding at taking very complicated topics, talking to an audience, and have them understand it or feel like they understand it like that. Yeah. And a lot of that you learn with time. Um, some of that you can learn through communication classes, et cetera. The other thing too is, is the senior management. My view is of, of senior management that they're always kind of jockeying around each other for a position, and, and not necessarily in a negative way or positive way, but you know they start getting senior enough and they want their own fiefdoms and this and that. And reading people around you is very important. Uh, in the government, we get new political managers all the time. <laughs> and I like to say one of the most important skills is managing your supervisors. And now sometimes you can't do that well, but sometimes you can. And so you learn their li dislikes, their likes, their ways of doing business, and then you best fit that mold with them, and often it allows you to kind of get what you want in your job. You know, that if they like this, well maybe I'll position it this way, and I'll get my little nugget over here. And it's those kind of things I think are more learned in the heat of battle over the years. But managing the people above you when you get to be a senior leader, I think is extremely important and might be as important as what you know and how well you do a job. We have time for one or two questions, and one of them has to be here since we keep skipping over her. You like tackle people or <laughs> aggressive? What's ag aggressive networking? That's like, what they call it. I, yeah, aggressive networking. It's just it's, it's seeking out people bluntly and just saying, you know, I'm interested in what you do. I'm interested in what you do. And I guess the line between being an interested student and interested in the work and just pushing it off on me is not how I would approach it. I just feel like I would never do it. Actually, I'm not talking. I'm not gonna make too much of a comment. I've never heard of that. First, could be my age, I don't know. Um, so I, I'm not sure how, I, I would have, you. I, if I were you, I'd ask around a little more about that, and I'm glad you're, you're asking us, but I personally don't know. I don't know about um, the rest of the panel, but it's almost like a sales job. So it's how you feel when sales people are pushing, 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 pushing on you. It's effective, I think, they end up getting the sell, but just be, I, I would say, be careful with it. But just remember, I've never heard of it. I've never done it. So be careful in taking my advice, too. Personally, for me, that, that would get annoying. So you got to do kind of be careful who you're networking with and if you can get a feel for, you know, if you cross that uh, annoyance line. But I do have at least one example like 20 or so years ago where one of my, my managers tried to coach me and said, every time I go to a meeting, I get cards of what I think may be the six most important influential people in the audience are. And then I give them cold calls. Once, once a year, I give them cold calls. And when he told me that, I kind of laughed it off, not to his face, but I laughed it off saying, you know, <laughs> that's not my personality. I don't believe it works. I think it would get annoying. Well, that person has been extremely successful in bopping into some jobs that I would have never guessed was possible. So I've seen it work. But it just caution you that you know it can get annoying depending on you know who you're pinging for those opportunities. But you know I do know of a, of a case that it really worked. So it's something I, I've never call, heard it called aggressive, um, but it does happen and it does exist. And, and we get cold emails. I'm interested, and in, some of them we will forward to the recruiting department. But it's a fine line between wanting that job and very interested to you don't want to become what we call a stalker, <laughs> you know? Because if you if you continue on, it can be pushing and it can work against you. It's aggressive and you're working toward a job, but it also can have a negative effect in that, okay, no, we're not really interested. It's not the personality, so 
be mindful and be very selective if you're going to do it and how you do it. These panel members. Okay, go ahead. at one point, you could be subtle about it and if you have a research paper you may have written or something significant in the field in which you're trying to get in, I don't see where it would be a problem if you sent it to someone, say, just maybe of interest, you know, something small like that instead of pushing. Wrote this, here's a new model you may want to consider in your department. And they're going to call you if they like it, right? I think, too, I see we're going to finish, and I wanted to have a few notes on, and it's something relative to the one question about, you know, how do you distinguish yourself? And, and let me give you just a couple real-life examples. And, again, sometimes it's by dumb luck and sometimes it's by good planning. But if you have some skill set, like you're a, you're a concert pianist or you're a magician or, you know, you want a tennis tournament somewhere, don't be afraid to bring those things up because depending on the person you're interviewing, it can make a difference. Also, sometimes a clever comment in an interview. So let me go through. I know we're probably running on time, but I have some examples that may hit home with you. They're a little old, but uh, I think they still apply today. So I had a roommate who was interviewing for dental schools, and way back then, Georgetown was one of the best dental schools in the country. He got in a few other schools, didn't get into some, so not necessarily the most stellar student. So he goes into the Georgetown interview, and, and the, the, the doctor that was interviewing him says, okay, so-and-so, we reject 10 people for every one that we accept. You know, who should I say no to? And he says, you should say no to the next 10 people that come in the room. Mm -hmm. Go out, I'm into Georgetown. You know, and I'm not suggesting <laughs> you, you be clever, okay? But, but that's an example where some off-the-cuff thing can make a difference, you know? And some examples of skill sets, and, and these will go to, to my kids. My son, um, who now is in graduate school, my oldest, what, it is an outstanding magician. But just like artists, they're starving magicians, right? So my whole life, I'm a fearful parent of, well, don't become <laughs> a starving magician. But phenomenal. I mean, the school that he went to, the president brings him in for get-togethers. He could, you know, like, stick to the school, stick to the school. Mm -hmm. But being a magician got him a couple scholarships that distinguished him from everybody else. Everybody had the grades and everybody had the classwork. And so sometimes those little things can make a difference. Uh, my two younger boys... When they were younger, you may hear these commercials on Quibbits, Q, uh, I don't even really understand what it is, but about four years ago, they started a business. <laughs> and I watched over them. They were still in high school, and I didn't want to get sued and want to make sure they're going down a good path. Well, they eventually developed a small business, then they sold it and, and got a little past break even. But I thought, great working experience for them to have. You know, I didn't know what it really would lead to. Well, my middle son got a, a great job, and in that job interview, they spent 70% of the interview curious about the business he started and how it really worked. All right, so you just never, ever can hmm. predict. Um, another person that I interviewed and hired way back when came in and said, you know, I was a nurse, and it was male, which, you know, not that that's all, but back then, you know, it was okay. He goes, but I was a nurse, successful nurse. Now I'm getting chemical engineering degree. And that was enough for me to distinguish him from everybody else that came before me where the resumes start looking and feeling and sounding the same. And uh, when I get my first job out of school in Bell Labs, I was by far not the most qualified person to go to a distinguished place like Bell Labs. And after I got there, I find out they hired me because I was getting two masters, so that distinguished me some from everybody else. And the guy who, who hired me was just so impressed by getting two degrees, he picked me over all these other candidates. Mm -hmm. So the point being with all those examples is if you can distinguish yourself, because really on paper at this, at this level of your career, people all start to look the same and blend together. Mm -hmm. And so distinguish yourself maybe personally, and if you can professionally, these kind of summer interns help you distinguish yourself a little bit, but distinguishing yourself from the others is critical. So always keep that in mind when you're doing resumes 
and even in interviews, if there's something you could say or do that distinguishes yourself and makes me feel like you're a little different and, and in a good way, then all of a sudden you rise to the top just because of that unique little aspect. So always keep that in mind. Not everyone can say they want to make you lean and mellow. <laughs> These panelists have had very challenging jobs and they took time out of their jobs to be here. So please join me in thanking them for being here. <laughs> have this for each of you. Thank you. Token of our appreciation. We have the opportunity before they head off to uh, take a group picture. So, um, Lilas, do you want to direct us out to the steps?